It's that time of year when your car and outdoor furniture are tinted that beautiful hue of yellow and your allergies are in overdrive. Some people suffer in the spring when the grass is turning green, the flowers are showing off their blooms, and the trees are budding. Others never seem to get a break. You're listening to Healthy Looks Great on You, a lifestyle medicine podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Vicki Petz Casper. For two decades, I practiced as a board certified obstetrician gynecologist, navigating the complex world of women's health. But life took an unexpected turn when my own health failed. Emerging on the other side, I discovered the transformative power of lifestyle medicine. Now, I'm on a mission to share its incredible benefits with you. So buckle up, because we are going on a journey to our very own mini medical school, where you will learn how lifestyle medicine can help prevent, treat, and sometimes even reverse disease. This is episode 118. Seasonal Allergies and the Immune System. Today we'll go to Mini Medical School to learn about the immune system and what you can do about seasonal allergies. And if you're wondering what that has to do with lifestyle medicine, stay tuned. A lot of people are affected by allergies. It's one of the most common chronic conditions in the world. In fact, 10 to 30 percent of children and adults in the United States and other industrialized countries suffer with allergies. And I do mean suffer. Symptoms include a stuffy runny nose, which sounds like a paradox. You know, either it's stopped up or it's running, but how can it be both? But you know it can be. When your watery eyes are affected with itchiness and redness, that's called allergic conjunctivitis. More than your eyes may itch, including your nose, the roof of your mouth, called the palate, and that little tickle in the back of your throat. Skin is also affected. You may even break out in hives. Some people cough and sneeze, and there's that nasty mucus stuff that runs down the back of your throat. Ugh, affectionately known as post-nasal drip. Tis the season to be sneezing, runny, stuffy nose, and itching eyes, not to mention cough, irritability, and fatigue. Some of that is because all of this lovely stuff affects our sleep. Wait a minute, this sounds a lot like the common cold, or even COVID, doesn't it? There is some overlap in symptoms, and I'll tell you how you can know the difference in a bit. But allergies make up 2.5% of all visits to the doctor and result in 2 million missed days from school, 6 million lost work days, and a total price tag of somewhere around 6 to $11 billion. When I was growing up, my dad had what we called hay fever. Now, we didn't live anywhere near any hay. But every spring, my mom mowed the yard because it literally made him physically sick. Now, make no mistake, my mom likes to mow anyway, and she'd still do it if she could pull the cord on her manual start push mower, but I remember him saying he felt like worms were crawling around in his eyes, and to be honest, it looked that way too. They were watery and red, and he had those shiners, you know, the baggy dark circles under the eyes, and the good news is, well, I inherited them, ugh. What he actually had was seasonal allergies from pollen, which is a heavy blanket that the trees, grasses, and weeds used to cover the south, especially. But I guess no one wanted to call it weed fever or flower fever, and in the fall, ragweed is the big offender, and you can find it just about anywhere. It blooms and releases pollen from August to November. Other things that are out to get you are burning bush, cockleburr, pigweed, sagebrush, and tumbleweed. Allergies are specific to regions because what grows is specific to those climates. And because of that, they're predictable year after year. Some people wish their allergies were seasonal. Instead, they react to dust mites found in stuffed animals, carpet, pillows, along with mold spores, animal dander, and cockroaches, double yuck. These are called perennial allergies. Now, people with seasonal allergies also tend to react to mold spores, so when it's especially damp, their symptoms are triggered. 
That's because mold spores grow when it's hot and humid, like where I live. And though rain washes everything off, pollen counts tend to spike afterwards. Also, when it's windy, pollen counts go up. So what should you do? Move away to somewhere that doesn't have any plants and weeds? Good luck with that. While some places are better than others, allergens are literally everywhere. Gosh, this is starting to sound like a botany podcast. And well, botany is boring, so let's go to mini medical school and learn about something more exciting, the immune system. Your immune system is charged with keeping out invaders who want to destroy your body. Side note, my immune system tried to kill me with what's called an autoimmune disease. Auto means self, so myself attacked myself because nobody besides me is tough enough to knock me down. That's another story for another day. We will talk about autoimmune disease in a future episode of this podcast. And now would probably be a good time to remind you that you can get this podcast delivered straight to your inbox so you don't miss a future episode. I'll put a link in the show notes to sign up or you can go to my website. That's www.healthylooksgreatonyou.com. There are sign up sheets there. Or, if you'd rather, just follow me on Apple, Podbean, Spotify, oh, and I almost forgot, YouTube. If you go to any of those locations, you can find previous episodes on things like type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and dementia prevention. All right, this podcast is not on autopilot, so get out your notebook for a little anatomy and physiology. By the way, in my office, I have an ancient copy of Gray's Anatomy. Did you know it's an illustrated textbook that has anatomical drawings and has been used in medical schools for years before it was a drama series on TV? And if allergies was an episode on that show, I'm sure someone would have an anaphylactic reaction and be saved by epinephrine in the emergency room. An anaphylactic reaction is a real thing and it can be fatal. Think extreme allergic reaction. These are the people that need to carry an EpiPen. Now, Back to the normal immune system. It's trying to keep out things that might harm you, like bacteria, viruses, fungus, and such. And if any of those pesky invaders do show up, your immune system should kick in to kick them out before they do harm. Shall we start with the anatomy since we're all thinking about the show now? The immune system is made up of lymphoid organs, you know, like lymph nodes, only so much more. These organs grow lymphocytes and then mature them. Then they're released whenever there's a breach in the wall of protection. Lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell and they circulate in the blood vessels. But blood vessels aren't the only carrier on the block. We also have lymphatic vessels. You may be familiar with the term lymphedema. One of the most common causes is when women have breast cancer and the lymph nodes under the arm have to be removed. The result is there's no transport system for all that lymphatic fluid, so it builds up and makes the arm look puffy and swollen. Normally, the lymphatic system moves these lymphocytes around to different parts of the body where they're needed to fight the good fight. The lymphoid system is made up of several organs. Some of this is going to sound familiar, but hopefully you'll learn a little something too. Let's start with A for adenoids. These glands are at the back of the nasal passages and are often removed along with another set of lymphoid organs, the tonsils, when they go into overdrive. The spleen is an organ located within the belly that serves in the immune system's brigade. If you've had your spleen removed, which occurs sometimes because of trauma and sometimes because it's implicated in defecting and fighting against you in another autoimmune disease such as ITP or idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. People without a spleen are particularly vulnerable to a specific type of pneumonia called pneumococcal pneumonia. So, if you've had your spleen removed, or if your immune system is compromised, or if you're just over the age of 65, there is a pneumococcal vaccine to prevent this. I still have my spleen, but the lymphoid organ I don't have is my thymus gland. It's a gland that sits on top of the heart under the breastbone and is responsible for the development of the immune system. But it's supposed to get turned off when you grow up. Eh, Sometimes this glitches and gets reactivated. I have a disease called myasthenia gravis, and it's one of the only reasons to have your thymus gland removed other than having a tumor. 
The largest immune organ in the body is the gut. And that's why gut health is coming to the forefront in autoimmune diseases in particular and overall health in general. There'll be an upcoming episode on gut health. You probably know about bone marrow. It's the soft part inside the bones, and it's where those infection-fighting white blood cells are made. Another organ you know about, but maybe didn't know it had an immune function, is the appendix. When I was in medical school, I was taught that it was a vestigial organ, and like the tonsils, had no purpose. There's nothing worse than having no purpose in life. In the old days, if you had any kind of abdominal surgery, they took the useless thing out, even on a C-section. But then they realized that God didn't create some little worm-shaped part of the intestine for nothing, and that it did have some immune function. Last on the anatomical review is lymph nodes. These little bean-shaped structures are throughout the body. When there's an infection, they often enlarged, and it's organized like a drainage system. So when there's an infection in a certain place, the coordinating lymph nodes enlarge because they're working overtime to send out fighter cells to attack the offending agent. Now that we've looked at anatomy, let's talk some physiology. When a foreign body comes in, in this case an allergen is maybe breathed in, ingested, or comes in contact with the skin or eyes, then your body makes an antibody. Anti means against. So now, the fight is on. And this is where it gets really interesting. These antibodies are called immunoglobulins, specifically immunoglobulin E, or IgE for short. These antibodies are very specific, and they're tailored not only for specific allergens, but even for specific pollens. So if you're allergic to ragweed, when you get exposed to ragweed, your body has IgE antibodies at the ready to produce a reaction. That's why each time you get exposed to an allergen, your body reacts stronger and stronger. That's also why people who are allergic to things like bee stings do need to carry an EpiPen because each sting produces a stronger reaction because the body is getting primed with each exposure. But not everyone is allergic to bees or pollen or anything. Some people are more at risk for allergies than others. And it just might have to do with your birthday. What? If you're born during the spring or fall when pollen is plentiful, you might be more prone to have seasonal allergies to pollen. Weirdly enough, male sex and firstborn status also increase the risk by three to five fold. As with many things, there's often a genetic predisposition. You know I always say, choose your parents wisely. Family history is a risk factor. Moms who smoke and babies who are exposed to smoke in the first year of life have more allergies. Heavy exposure to dust mites in early childhood is another risk factor. So if you've got old, sentimental, stuffed animals, maybe it's not a good idea to keep those in the nursery. Also, old carpet, pillows, and bedding may need to go. The use of antibiotics early in life also increases the risk of allergies. And antibiotics are way overused, and it creates a whole host of problems like resistance and other infections, such as C. diff. And sometimes we have to have them, but not for a cold or any other viral infection. Doctors and other providers and patients always should ask, what are we treating? And if the answer is a viral infection, antibiotics do no good. I used to tell my patients who had sinus symptoms or an upper respiratory infection that I thought was viral, you'll get better in 14 days without an antibiotic and two weeks if you take one. Rewind that if you missed it. Now, this takes us back to an earlier question. How do you know if it's allergies or a cold or COVID? One big distinguishing factor is fever. Fever is medically defined as 100.4 or greater. If you have fever, you're more likely to have an infection. Does that mean you need an antibiotic? If you said not necessarily, then you passed medical school with honors. The common cold, RSV, and COVID, and any other virus is not affected by antibiotics. To treat a virus, you need an antiviral. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get a secondary bacterial infection when you have a virus. You definitely can. 
and that needs to be treated with antibiotics. So to be a real doctor, you have to go to real medical school because treating infections isn't simple or cookbook. Timing is another way to distinguish allergies from a cold or COVID. Runny nose happens in all of them, but with allergies, it starts with the exposure. And a cold or COVID doesn't start until a few days after exposure. If you have body aches, that's also more likely to be an infection. Now, to determine whether or not you have COVID or a cold, you probably just need to do a test because otherwise it's impossible to know because there is so much overlap in symptoms. So, what's the big deal about allergies anyway? Well, allergic rhinitis is actually associated with cognitive and psychiatric issues in kids and teens. What? Yep, turns out it's hard to pay attention with snot pouring out of your nose. When concentration is affected, test scores, and even athletic performance and work performance can suffer. That can snowball and lead to low self-esteem, anxiety, depression, and even ADD. Overall quality of life can be lower. What in the world do seasonal allergies have to do with lifestyle? Well, I'm glad you asked. First of all, I mentioned earlier that they can affect your sleep and poor sleep has such a profound impact on health. It increases your risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, heart disease, and depression. And remember, this is a lifestyle medicine podcast. So we are going to talk about the relationship between lifestyle and medicine. But first, let's go back to mini medical school. You've already passed your anatomy and physiology class. So it's time to move on to pathology and a little pharmacology. Let's start with some immune cells that are involved in allergic reactions, mainly cytokines and inflammatory mediators like histamines, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes. And I already mentioned IgE, and it goes haywire in allergic diseases like asthma, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis like eczema. Let's just call it all an inflammatory response. That makes it easier. You see, chronic inflammation just feeds itself So people with allergies get more and more sensitive. Histamine levels go up and up and inflammatory cells are really good at talking their buddies into joining the crowd. So before you know it, people with allergic rhinitis are now sensitive not only to pollen, but perfumes and other strong smells. Do you remember that musical South Pacific? I love old Broadway musicals. It's really not one of my favorites, though. But there's a song where she's going to wash that man right out of my hair. Turns out you can wash inflammatory cells and irritants right out of your nose. Now, doesn't that sound fun? Well, it sounds like torture if you don't have allergies, but it might be the lesser of two evils if you do. You can use saline nose sprays or chromalin sodium nasal sprays. If you do need medication, steroid nose sprays are best for stuffy nose, but you gotta use them every day to see a good result, and it may take up to a week. If your symptoms are itching, sneezing, and runny nose, then you might need an antihistamine. If your eyes are the primary location of attack, then use antihistamine drops, so you don't get all those side effects of taking antihistamines, like fatigue and drowsiness. And while we're talking about that, I want to caution you about a very common over-the-counter medication that a lot of people take and a lot of doctors think they shouldn't, Benadryl or diphenhydramine. Some people use it for sleep too. It's in things like Tylenol PM. But here's the deal. It can impair your driving worse than drinking and driving. I mean, I never heard of anyone getting a DUID, but sleepy driving causes more accidents than drunk driving. And a long time ago, I heard a study where they took college students and had them drive a car using a simulator. They got them drunk and measured their ability to drive. And then later, after they had sobered up, gave them Benadryl and measured their ability to drive. And guess what? They drove about the same. But you know what the difference was? The people taking diphenhydramine did not realize they were impaired, whereas the people who were drunk knew they couldn't drive. The other thing is elderly people. They shouldn't take it. It can worsen symptoms of dementia and make them more prone to fall. And while we're talking about what not to do, let me also mention decongestants. These are things like Sudafed or Pseudoephedrine, and while they can alleviate stuffy nose, you must be careful because they can increase blood pressure. And those decongestant nasal sprays can be addictive. 
No, not that kind of addiction where you're craving the next dose. But if you use nasal decongestant sprays like Afrin for more than three days, you will get rebound nasal stuffiness. So you squirt some more Afrin up your nose to relieve it. And as soon as it wears off, you get more stuffiness. And if it's too late and you're already using it chronically, then talk to your doctor, but you'll probably need to switch to a steroid nasal spray to get off of them. Prescription medications can be very effective, and sometimes you need to see an allergist so you know what you're allergic to. Then you can start the very easy process of eliminating exposure. Ha! I'm kidding. My son had severe allergies. Well, actually, he still does, but he moved to the West Coast. And while he's out there, they're better. But he swears as soon as the door on the plane lands when he comes to visit me, he starts sneezing. And I've heard him, so I believe him. And the more allergen, the bigger the immune response, and the bigger the immune response, the worse you feel. I'm definitely not recommending that he stay away, but reducing exposure is important. And here are some general recommendations. People who are allergic to dust, dust mites, mold, or pets should wash and dry all of their bedding with heat, even the blankets and comforter if possible. There are also mattress and pillow covers that can help and take down the curtains, throw away the bed skirts, and keep out as much carpeting as possible. If you aren't already exhausted, change out your HVAC filters and vacuum often using a HEPA filter. When it comes to pets, outside is better, but if you have a dog in the house, make sure they get a good bath every week. But good luck bathing a cat. Besides, that doesn't seem to make a difference. It does help to know what you're allergic to. That's why seeing an allergist can help. I mean, it's hard to avoid triggers if you don't know what your triggers are. If pollen is your big issue, it helps to know which pollens you're allergic to. Monitor pollen counts and resist the temptation to open the windows when they're high. It's impossible to avoid all your triggers, so what about allergy shots? Well, they work, which is weird because they're actually injecting tiny amounts of whatever you're allergic to, and that seems counterintuitive. But if you have allergies that interfere with your life, they do work. Now, it takes a while. And if you're the parent, you might have to chase your kid around the house, but probably not because you'll actually take them to a clinic to get their shot and be monitored afterward to make sure they don't have a bad reaction. But have you ever seen those reels where kids are talking about what it's like to have a parent as a doctor? You know, they come in and have their arms chopped off and their parents like, oh, you'll be fine. Well, I gave my son his allergy shots at home, and there was no shortage of me chasing him around the house and pinning him down to do it. I don't recommend it. Now, I am a doctor of lifestyle medicine, so I am interested in how diet, exercise, and stress affect allergies. And just a little warning, some people are actually allergic to exercise, seriously, but in most cases, it's an excuse or just something people say in jest, but there are rare cases of anaphylaxis with exercise. But I'm pretty comfortable telling you that exercise is safe and good for people with allergies because it improves cardiorespiratory fitness, which lowers your blood pressure, heart and respiratory rate, as well as oxygen consumption. But most of all, exercise can lower stress because it lowers the old stress hormone cortisol. And stress makes allergies worse. And allergies are stressful, so that's a vicious cycle with one feeding the other and both growing into a mucousy mess of snot. Stress can amplify allergic conditions, and it's not psychological. It's actually physical. The autonomic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis are big players. Now, I don't want you to think that your autonomic nervous system is out to get you. It's not. It actually exists to keep you safe. Those danger, danger signals tell the part of your brain called the hypothalamus to mobilize chemical messengers from the nearby pituitary gland, which then command the adrenal glands to release cortisol and epinephrine or adrenaline so that your heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure rise so you can move fast and avoid or fight the threat. And obviously, that's a good thing when there is a threat. Problem is, some people have chronic stress and the system never ramps down like it's supposed to. That not only makes allergies worse, but it affects sleep, weight gain, and the risk of all kinds of diseases like high blood pressure, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes, not to mention depression and anxiety. So, the bottom line is that stress plus allergies does not equal healthy. Remember, your stress management techniques are important, 
But even though nature is a big stress reliever, you may need to stay inside during times when pollen counts are high, or at least wear a mask if your enemies are in bloom. If you do go outside, take a shower, wash your hair, and change your clothes as soon as possible. Lifestyle medicine has other components to treat, prevent, and sometimes even reverse disease. We talked about stress. We also talked about exercise and a little bit about how allergies can impair quality sleep. Social connectedness certainly takes a hit if you're coughing, sneezing, and blowing your nose constantly. And we know that social connectedness is crucial for good health. And what about harmful substances? Well, I mean, besides the allergens. Well, alcohol can react with some of those medications we talked about. And not smoking is just kind of a no-brainer. It makes everything worse. Even exposure to the smell of smoke on someone's clothes can trigger an allergic response in susceptible individuals. So that leaves us with diet and nutrition. And y'all, this is fascinating. The severity of allergic conditions is related to inflammation. And we now know that gut health and inflammation are linked. It's a lot of emerging science, so we're going to be talking about it more and more on this podcast. But here's what you need to know. Nutrients like vitamins A, D, and E, and minerals like zinc, iron, copper, and selenium, as well as dietary fiber, fatty acids, and phytochemicals can all suppress inflammation and therefore treat and sometimes even prevent allergic conditions. So maybe, just maybe, the elusive answer you've been searching for to help yourself or your kids is found in the kitchen. And I don't know about you, but that gets me super excited. It's still being researched, but there is definitely evidence that plant-based eating helps. And regardless, we know that the gut microbiome is important in all immune function. And of course, what you put in your mouth goes in your gut, so it stands to reason that nutrition and the bacteria that live there influence organs in your body, including the respiratory system and the skin, which are most affected by allergies. And researchers are looking at short-chain fatty acids, bile acids, and metabolites of tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid that is important in lymphatic function. Important in making it work sometimes in overdrive, so people with allergies have higher levels. Another amino acid, L-glutamine, amps up lymphocytes and cytokines, further supporting the theory that too much protein may contribute to developing or worsening allergies. Oh, I just heard you groan. We need to make sure we're getting enough protein. Yes, we do. But the truth is, most Americans get plenty. And we're going to explore that a little more soon. But I think we can all agree that diets high in polyunsaturated fat and cholesterol are not good for inflammation. And those largely come from animal fat. And on the other hand, monosaturated fats like olive oil lower the risk for asthma, according to some data. And high-fat diets make dermatitis worse. You see, a high-protein diet increases B cells and IgE, which are both involved in allergies. And in some studies, they're looking to see if calorie restriction puts the brakes on the production of inflammatory cells. Regardless, we know that obesity rates have risen in tandem with allergy rates. Of course, not everywhere, but in most industrialized countries where both of those conditions plague us. And there's no question that obesity makes asthma worse and weight loss helps. What about some foods that may help? This one may surprise you, but try asparagus. It has phospholipids that suppress IgE and have an anti-allergic effect. And hey, it's worth a try. And maybe cook it with a little olive oil, which helps allergies by making the gut barrier more protective and decreases IgE and histamines. And fiber does the same thing. And where is fiber found? That's right, only in plants. Of course, that's the biggest oversimplification of gut health in the world, but if you're interested in calming down allergies with diet, Think about flavonoids. These phytochemicals are found in fruits, veggies, herbs, spices, legumes, tea, and vinegar. And they can potentially help with allergies and asthma. Specifically, try to add more onions, apples, berries, tomatoes, grapes, nuts, and seeds to your diet. And even if you don't have allergies, 
these foods are good for you, making you healthier, and healthy looks great on you. The information contained in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered to be a substitute for medical advice. You should continue to follow up with your physician or healthcare provider and take medication as prescribed. Though the information in this podcast is evidence-based, new research may develop and recommendations may change.